Greetings from the University of Notre Dame. I am Jonathan Noble, Senior Assistant Provost for Internationalization and a faculty fellow of the Leo Institute for Asia and Asian Studies at the University of Notre Dame. I am delighted to serve as this event's moderator. Thank you for joining the global fragility and pandemic. Insight from Asia and Notre Dame, virtual discussions organized by the Leo Institute for Asia and Asian Studies with Notre Dame Internationals, Global Gateways and Centers in Beijing, Hong Kong, and Mumbai. The Leo Institute for Asia and Asian Studies provides a forum for integrated and multidisciplinary research and teaching on Asia. It supports innovative projects that actively combine teaching, research, and social engagement while promoting general awareness, understanding, and knowledge of Asia through organizing public events and supporting student and faculty scholarship and engagement with partners in Asia in support of the university's overarching mission. Notre Dame International's mission is to advance Notre Dame through international research and education and engagement worldwide. Through a network of 11 global gateways and centers in conjunction with over 100 strategic university partners, Notre Dame International prepares all members of the Notre Dame community to become global citizens who can effectively lead and serve the common good. Today's event is co-organized by Notre Dame's Beijing Global Gateway, which serves a critical role in connecting the University of Notre Dame to China and advancing the university's engagement with a range of academic partners in China. This is the second event in the online series on global fragility, the pandemic and Asia. Today's presentation is entitled the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in the Age of Coronavirus. This topic is of particular importance to the University of Notre Dame's mission, which asks us to care for the vulnerable, safeguard human dignity, and promote the common good. In 2015, all member states of the United Nations voted to adopt the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These 17 goals were described by former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon as a roadmap to ending global poverty, building a life of dignity for all, and leaving no one behind. But with the global spread of COVID-19, the UN is addressing a unique humanitarian crisis, including an economic cost that will challenge all 17 SDGs. My colleague, Professor Diane Desierto, will talk about the SDG implementation challenges in COVID-19 by discussing the latest findings of the United Nations in its SDG annual report 2020 in relation to Agenda 2030 and the challenges as a result of worsening inequalities reported by the United Nations. Her presentation will focus specifically on global challenges to SG, SDG 1, poverty eradication, SDG 3, good health and well-being, SDG 4, quality education, SDG 10, reduce inequalities. Professor Yi Feng Chun will then discuss the pandemic informal economy and social protection in Asia. Assessing the impact of the coronavirus on the world of work while highlighting challenges to the protection of workers at a time of pandemic with special reference to Asia and offering reflections on an inclusive and sustainable approach to social protection in the recovery process. I am now delighted to introduce our two distinguished panelists. Diane Desierto is an associate professor of human rights law and global affairs and a faculty fellow 
at the Leo Institute for Asia and Asian Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Her research examines international economic law and development with a focus on international human rights and humanitarian law. Professor Desierto is the author of about 100 law review articles, book chapters, and essays, and has co-authored forthcoming books on international economic law and ASEAN law and regional, regional integration. She is also active as counsel in matters successfully litigated before the UN Human Rights Committee, the International Criminal Court, the Philippine Supreme Court, the Philippine Commission on Human Rights, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Professor Desierto held a law faculty appointment at the Peking University School of Transnational Law. Yifeng Chun is an associate professor at the Peking University Law School and assistant director of the Peking University Institute of International Law. He studies the history and theory of international law international organizations, as well as international and comparative labor law. Before joining Peking University, Professor Chun was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki, as well as a visiting scholar to the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law in Heidelberg, Germany, the Lauterpacht Center for International Law at the University of Cambridge, Stockholm Center for International Law and Justice, and the Norwegian Center for Human Rights. I'm now delighted to invite Professor Desierto to share her presentation with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and good morning to those in Notre Dame and good evening to those who are watching us in Asia, particularly in the Beijing campus. It is an honor on my end to be able to address colleagues and engage with colleagues in China, especially since it's been some years since I last taught at Peking University School of Transnational Law. My task today is to talk about the implementation challenges for the Sustainable Development Goals in light of today's pandemic. Let me permit me to share my screen now. The challenges are distinct, especially since, as Jonathan rightly pointed out, there is a unique global humanitarian, humanitarian crisis that affects all of the SDGs. For my purposes today, however, I will simply focus on four of them, and especially considering the reopening decisions that states are making today, what some of the challenges, legal, institutional, structural, and policy challenges will be for the realization of SDG implementation in the future. But first, let me summarize some of the brief setbacks from the SDG Annual Report 2020, which, just, which was just released about, several, about a week and a half ago. We recall first that the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development essentially said it is a bold goal from 2015 to 2030 to end poverty and hunger everywhere, to combat inequalities, to build peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, to protect human rights, promote gender equality and ensure the lasting protection of the planet and its resources, particularly looking at the creation of conditions for sustainable, inclusive and sustained economic growth, decent work for all. The vision for Agenda 2030 is a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, the rule of law, justice, equality and non-discrimination, respect for race, ethnicity, and cultural diversity, and of equal opportunity permitting the full realization of the human potential. And as such, when we look at economic growth, we are not just looking at raw economic growth, but we are looking at sustained, inclusive, sustainable economic growth that is premised on decent work for all and democracy, good governance, and the rule of law. And yes, including climate sensitivity, respect for biodiversity, and resilience, environmental resilience. 
as such, when we look at the SDGs, these are not simply aspirational goals, but actually binding commitments taken by states under Agenda 2030, where all states admitted that the agenda is guided by the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, including full respect for international law. More than that, it is grounded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in international human rights treaties. The method, therefore, for reaching Agenda 2030 is premised on international law and human rights law. Let's look at what the result has been from COVID-19 with respect to essentially, especially SDG 1 on ending or the eradication of poverty. Before COVID-19, we were already off the projections about eliminating extreme poverty by 2030. After COVID-19, the poverty rate is now projected to reach 8.8%, which is the first rise in global poverty since 1998. There is now an estimated 71 million additional people that will be living in extreme poverty due to COVID-19, many of which are located in Southern Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Women are also those who are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. They are those who are closest to reaching the extreme poverty line. Young workers are also exposed to poverty more systematically than adults as a result of their inadequate earnings and deficits in job qualities. Given the inherent inequalities already for this demographic, the UN reports that the disparities will be exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis, which is already leading to sharp increases in un unemployment, underemployment, a decline in labor income, and job quality challenges. Now, one of the major challenges with the eradication of poverty is that when we're hit with a crisis, this is exactly where the essential necessity for social protection systems is so glaringly evident. But we find, and the United Nations has found, that 55% of the world's population, or about 4 billion people, did not benefit from any form of social protection in 2016. The updated information is not as promising either. As of February 2020, only 87 countries had unemployment protection programs that are anchored in their national legislation, and only 34 of these countries cover the self-employed. This tells us that especially in a time of mass layoffs, in a time of declining incomes, so many persons, millions around the world, do not have reliable forms of social protection to cushion from these exact um, challenges of sudden and inexplicable poverty. This also spills over to SG, SDG 2 on zero hunger, where the UN urgently reported that there is now a glaring food insecurity crisis affecting about 700 million people with worsening situations in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Now the pandemic is threatening our global food system, the small scale production of farmers around the world, chronically undernourished children under five, which are about 47 million in the world. And it is tending to shift traditional investments into ag agriculture to meet fiscal emergencies, particularly on medical supplies. And this is giving rise to a chain or a ripple effect of food insecurity throughout the world, not just in Asia, but the rest of the world as well. This also spills over to SDG 3 on good health and well-being. The UN already noted that COVID-19 will reverse years of progress that have already been made in reducing maternal and child deaths, particularly because of the stresses and disruptions to routine healthcare systems and processes during this pandemic. There is a global interruption of childhood immunization efforts that will have generational consequences. There is very evidently precarious situations of obtaining critical care for people with non-communicable diseases, heart diseases, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, for those between the ages of 30 and 70. If before COVID-19, there was already a strong challenge in trying to achieve universal health coverage by 2030, the situation is worse now because of the fiscal stresses that many states around the world are facing. And what is worse, given this emergency, which is a global 
humanitarian and health emergency, there is a dire shortage of medical personnel. With respect to education, the situation has also been heavily impacted. As we have seen throughout the world, 1.57 billion school children have been subjected to global school closures, but not all schools and not all levels have all had recourse to distance learning solutions. There are very evident poverty barriers to completing education, with remote learning being out of reach for the poorest regions of the world. And even for those schools that are reopening, there are still increased risks to the health and safety of vulnerable children, the lack of basic infrastructure in schools to deal with the heightened health risks from COVID-19. That said, therefore, what would be, in my view, some of the legal, institutional, structural, and policy cha challenges to implementing the SDGs going forward? even assuming that we can still reach the targets of SDGs under Agenda 2030, particularly since many, many states around the world, in all continents in the world, have variable decisions when it comes to reopening their economies. The first are a set of legal challenges, which is extant from the United Nations own survey, the question of whether countries, when they undertake to reopen uh, their economies and they try to implement and prioritize SDGs. Do these countries comply with all international law and human rights law as the path or method to the implementation of SDGs? That's the first question. The second question relates to the Declaration on the Right to Development upon which Agenda 2030 was also premised. That declaration requires that states enable the participation, contribution, and enjoyment of the right to development by all members of their respective populations. Is this being done by states in their plans for reopening economies? The third question, if there is, if, with respect to plans to reopen, are there, is there full transparency of data that is relied upon by states with respect to any dimension of the reopening plans? Those are all legal questions. The answers are different according to the jurisdiction that we're faced with. But there are also a set of different answers to this. Maybe we can get into this later um, during the Q&A that might pertain to international law and human rights law. As to institutional and structural challenges, we now also face a serious issue with the decline, the steady decline in the last decade of foreign aid and development assistance, even before the onset of the pandemic. It is more crucial now because the pandemic has also resulted in states that formerly were donor states cutting aid and development assistance. And the question here would be how would states be able to meet their obligations of international cooperation and assistance under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights? Another question is with respect to ensuring continuous food and medical supplies. Would states be justified if they took a more active hand in market interventions by invoking a very broad reading of necessity or national emergency as a justification in international law? And thirdly, with the UN's insistence, um, based on, on the April 2020 statement of Secretary General Antonio Guterres, that the global COVID-19 response must be centered on human rights compliance, is there a system for co coordinated monitoring and oversight of COVID-19 responses around the world? Now, recently, the Human Rights Council, which includes China, mandated the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to investigate and report on all states' emergency responses to COVID-19 and whether or not human rights have been complied with in the process. And that is still a pending investigation. Finally, with respect to policy challenges, and probably this is a broader context within which to look at the issues of implementation of SDGs. The challenge today, which is very evident from the state of global affairs, is whether or not international cooperation, especially on SDG implementation, could still materialize in an era of resurgent nationalisms and waning multilateralism in the international system. There are many states that have asserted that the SDGs 
appear to be too totalizing, too generalized, cannot differentiate according to particular contexts. So in this case, should the SDGs start being reframed or reformed to take into account individualized contexts or geographic or regional contexts, politically, socially, economic, or otherwise, that can affect any state or region's capacity to reach the SDG targets in Agenda 2030. And lastly, this is an ongoing controversy with respect to the SDG implementation in general, because what methodology is appropriate for assessing the effectiveness of a state's SDG implementation? To date, SDG implementation still does not track or evaluate states or link a state's compliance with international law and human rights to implement the SDGs. But now that the UN is moving closer and declaring that all COVID responses must be centered on premised on human rights law and international law, we might see the push towards a methodology that more deliberately and intentionally um, inculcates human rights compliance and international law compliance in the methods of SDG implementation. I will stop here and turn the floor over to my colleague and I look forward to further engagement today. Thank you, Professor Desierto, for sharing your valuable insights about the ways in which the pandemic is exacerbating challenges to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and also for raising many important questions for our continued discussion and deliberation. I would like to remind the audience that you're very welcome to ask questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So you'll see a Q&A button and please feel free to uh, in, uh, uh, provide questions for the panelists. We will now hear from Professor Yi Feng Chun uh, on his presentation on the pandemic, informal economy, and social protection in Asia. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer Liu Institute and the Notre Dame International for organizing this event. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with uh, the audience and also with my colleagues. <laughs> When we are separated by the virus, it's even more important for us to have this kind of opportunity to exchange ideas and views. Today, I would like to address the, one of the key issues in our response to this pandemic. Uh, so uh, basically the informal economy and social protection in Asia. The pandemic of COVID-19 is devastating from a public health perspective and has also brought profound change and a challenge to the economic and social life of the world. As the coronavirus more, is more likely to persist for, uh, for a while, its impact on the global order, trade arrangement, economic outlook might be very much sustaining. So as the global combat against the virus see no immediate return at this moment, the economic and social consequence could be disastrous, structural, and even irreversible. The closure of business and the loss of jobs may be forced to be permanent. Temporary unemployment may become a complete economic inactivity. However, the hardship caused by the coronavirus is falling unevenly on different groups and on different countries across the world. Economically and socially speaking, Asia is among the most vulnerable region in this pandemic. As my colleague Zanetta suggested, according to estimation of the World Bank, the virus could push 71 million people into extreme poverty. And unfortunately, it is estimated that almost half of the project new pool will be in South Asia. 
In addition, it is also estimated by the World Trade Organization that the world trade is expected to fall by between 13 and 30 and 32 percent in 2020 as the coronavirus disrupt normal economic activity and life. So this would have a severe impact on country and sector in this region that heavily relies on export of goods and service for revenue. And the decline of tourism has also had a disastrous effect on some Asian countries like Thailand and Cambodia. In the economic field and in the world of work, the coronavirus has led to the suspension, closure, or transformation of workplace. It has a direct impact on the goal number eight of the UN SDG. Basically, by 2030, to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men. So I, today I would like to highlight a few challenges that this virus has brought to, the, to, to, to Asia. And I, I would like to share probably some of the, of the measures and experience that China has adopted. By, by way of conclusion, I could try to outline some of the possible strategies. One special difficulty in this region is the prevalence of informal economy. The degree of informality in this region is highest globally, affecting close to 70% of all workers in countries like Cambodia, Indonesia, and Myanmar. More than 80% of workers are working in informal sectors. And in China, we also had an estimation of between 30 to 40% of the economy being informal. Globally, more than 2 billion workers are in informal employment. This would include those self-employed, contract workers, temporary workers, platform workers, family contributors, and others with uncertain or no employment status or entitlements. The phenomenon of informality comes with a number of significant implications. First of all, informal workers suffer disproportionately from job and income loss. Of these 2 billion workers, 1.6 billion face an imminent threat to their life, livelihoods as average income in the informal economy shrank by 60% in the first month of the pandemic. So we have seen many people in the informal economy are not only having a financial crisis, but a real existential crisis. Secondly, the informal workers often lack access to social protection, such as unemployment benefits, sickness benefits, paid leave, maternity or parent benefits, special social assistance, food allocation, and et cetera. The workers often have to support their family on their own in, at this difficult time. Even if the governments may provide some support in this exceptional situation, the support provided by the government is often limited either in the coverage or in amount of support. Thirdly, the informal workers often perform jobs that expose them to considerable risk of contracting virus. This includes, for example, platform workers for food delivery service. In China, the DD drivers and many others. The health risk is further exacerbated by the poor housing and sanitation conditions, a lack of access to clean water and overpopulation in the region. So there's a real health risk for those people who are working in the informal sector who will not be able to protect themselves with sufficient protective equipment. Fourthly, it is also difficult to enforce lockdowns and some other public health measures for long periods in countries with high proportion of informality. Governments are usually unable to extend prolonged benefits owing to the constraints of the fiscal capacity. 
people are increasingly aware that home quarantine is largely a privilege of the middle class who can afford to temporarily withdraw from the economic activities or whose work can be performed at home by teleworking. And I'd like to add that according to the estimation of the International Labour Organization, only about 18% of the workers are doing jobs and are in location that could lend themselves to teleworking. So this is not at all option for all. It is therefore warned by the International Labour Organization that millions of working poor are already in the situation of fragility and now are, th are threatened by the virus to become a double casualties. And the most vulnerable group, including women, children, elderly, will be hard hit the hardest. And in some sectors, for example, those heavily reliant on accommodation service, food service, restaurants, theaters, recreational industries are also about to experience long-term difficulties, especially in those low-income countries. China, I would, like, I would now like to move to China's response. China has also encountered a great economic difficulty due to the coronavirus. As the virus hit first broke out in Wuhan, China enforced a national lockdown for more than two weeks as of late January. Even when China had largely contained, even if China, even now, by now China has largely contained the virus, the economic reopening is still very prudent and met with many constraints. Many services and shops are not really reopened. The official statistics suggest the urban employment rate modestly rose from 4.7% at the end of 2019 to 5.7% by the end of June 2020. Yet the above figure does not cover rural population. It is estimated that as many as 10 to 20 million migrant workers have not returned to cities for employment. And there's also a new phenomenon that those migrant workers who moved back to the cities are not are then found themselves unemployed. There's also a decrease of employment in individually owned business. The economic recovery in China is complicated by the rising tension between US and China on trade, high technology, 5G, Hong Kong, and a, a few other issues. It is also further shadowed by the anticipated considerable downfall of the world trade volume in 2020. There are several measures have been suggested by the Chinese government. One thing suggested by the Chinese government is the store economy. At the press conference in late May, the Chinese Prime Li Keqiang pointed out that in China there are more than 600 million people living with monthly income less than 1,000 Chinese yuan, roughly 140 US dollars per month. Even China has become the second largest world economy. Its internal disparity and poverty remains a profound challenge for the government. And at the same conference, the Prime Li public called for people to ignite a store economy. He gave the example of Chengdu, where the regulation had been loosened to allow for street vendors. And it's altogether 36,000 street vendors were approved, creating economic opportunities for 400,000 people. And meanwhile, the government also tried to expand its unemployment benefit coverage. As I just said earlier, that there are about 10 to 20 million migrant workers in China may already in the status of unemployment. Yet in the first three months of 2020, only 2.3 million people have been able to receive unemployment benefit. And the high threshold of this unemployment benefit service in China has prevented many to 
receive the real benefit. So the government has now tried to loosen the regulation and to lower the threshold, try to make sure that people who are in need will be able to receive support up to six months. And there's also now increasing attention to creating jobs and education opportunities for the young people. It's, it, is, it is now noticed globally that there's a danger of a lockdown generation in the making. Many of the young people may not be able to complete their school. And in China this year alone, that we are about to have more than 8.7 million people, people graduating from high school, or from universities, from colleges. And part of the response is that the Ministry of Education has decided to enlarge the recruitment of the postgraduate program. So addition, uh, uh, additional 189,000 graduate student quota were given to the universities. So these are a few examples that I outline here to see how Chinese government respond to this crisis. So now I'd like to come to some concluding remarks. I think it's, it is very important to implement, for the government to put money to implement measures for employment retention and promotion. So the money should not just go to bigger business, but it should also go to small business where the most employment are. And this project would be both aimed at public projects, but also at private sectors. So it should encourage flexibility in employment. Second, meanwhile, I think the government should also extend social protection as broadly as possible, especially the unemployment benefit, food prohibition, and other social assistance program. And if this coronavirus pandemic continues for another year, I think this would be really essential for the government to activate the social protection regime. Otherwise, it was going to be a really humanitarian disaster, not just a public health emergency. And third, I would say that we need to strengthen occupational safety and health measures, and we need to provide health access for those workers. Currently in China, that the contracting of coronavirus is not considered to be work injury, although this is covered by the medical uh, plan but it is not considered to be work injury. And I think there's great room to be improved. It is not in line with the suggestion of the ILO. And of course, I think we need to pay attention to the education program and to need to create employment opportunity for the young people. And it's, it's the unemployment rate of the young people in Asia is probably also the highest in the world. And we need to do something to support the young people, especially we need to invest in vocational training and, and others. Last but not least, I would say that we need to really invest in international collaboration. It is more than ever in, in, that we need to do international collaboration. Collaboration in medical supplies, future vaccine supplies. We also need to work on that relief. We need also to avoid protection measures in trade. And we also need to probably mobilize our international financial institutions to support the government in, handling and tackling this crisis. I think from the perspective of, of labor protection, I think we need, we see a still great room for the government to work together to create a decent uh, outlook for the workers. Thank you, Jonathan. I conclude my presentation here. Thank you, Professor Chun, for sharing your insights about the impact of the pandemic on labor issues in Asia, with particular focus on the informal economy and social protection. And thank you also, Professor Chun, for sharing your perspectives on China's experience. Um, I would like to remind the um, our audience again that you're very welcome to uh, pose your questions in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and I would first, as moderator, I would first like to ask our panelists a question um, that I think in 
coming from the educational sector is one that is um, on everyone's uh, minds in higher education, but also as many of our children are also um, facing new challenges with education. So according to UN statistics, school closures have kept 90% of students worldwide. It's about 1.57 billion out of school. Lack of access to computers and internet at home means remote learning is out of reach of many. And that's in the United States and also in many countries uh, throughout the world. Access to education during the pandemic may require technology. How are governments, and especially those in Asia, addressing this need for technology? Um, and what, what can uh, we do to help? meaning those in the audience, um, are there ways in which we can specifically play a uh, helpful role uh, in, uh, in, in helping to improve access to education during the pandemic? Jonathan, if I may. Yes. Yes. Precisely this, this, this issue of, of inequality in primary, secondary, and tertiary higher education has been at the forefront of discussions at UNESCO, as well as at this General Assembly, the Economic and Social Council of the General Assembly. It is particularly important to rally cooperation on this front because much of the technologies in particular for remote learning the platforms and the particular modalities of dual learning, hybrid learning, the kind of training that is necessary for this. This is not um, as ubiquitous in Asia, not even in my country, the Philippines, where many of the professors or the teachers would have to try and make or construct curricula from scratch that is adapted to um, technology that not all children have access to. So, in some regions of the world, what uh, some regions of Asia, and particularly in Southeast Asia, I know learning is taking place at the lowest governmental unit where there is shared access to one hub, one portal for technology purposes. Of course, that doesn't eliminate social distancing problems, but this is where, um, particularly since, as Professor Chen rightly pointed out, there is a, there is a, an imminent fear that the lockdown generation will find a regression in their educational objectives and in their trajectories of learning. There's a particular urgency for collaboration, not just with the UN agencies, but this is where the companies in the UN Global Compact can help. This is where the coordination, whether through investment or through assistance, is most urgent. And I know, at least from my reading of um, recent events and reports that the development agencies are looking very much towards building these kinds of collaborations, especially for Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you, Professor Desierto, uh, for your answer. Professor Chun, do you have any, would you like to share anything about China's experience with education and the link yes. to access uh, to education. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I think in China, we also have experienced a big challenge in doing the remote learning, but then the Ministry of Education quickly see this as an important policy to be uh, promulgated nationwide. So actually, even for the students working, studying at primary schools, they have to go through the uh, online learning. But this, of course, caused quite difficulties for, especially for the children who are living in countryside, in, in mountain areas, who might not have the electronic apps to access to the 
online learning process. And sometimes the, the international connection could be so bad that they would miss some classes. And, that, and I also see, see the big challenge even for the parents who, would be, who needed to oversee their children in, in learning. And I have seen a picture that one, 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 one couple who, who worked in the, in the market had to, take, had, to, had to take their daughter with them and the daughter would hide behind the board to, to study there. So it's the, basically the Chinese family put great emphasis on, in, in education, but this is, I think, a real challenge for everyone, for the family, for the students, for the teacher. And I think it also put it, bring back the question about the economic disparities and the poverty to, to the front. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chun. I would like to, we're receiving questions now from the audience, and I would like to uh, relay these questions to Professor Desierto and Professor Chun. One question um, for Professor Desierto uh, is, uh, how do you think different UN agencies should play a more efficient and effective role to help countries' economic recovery? Um, I did answer it briefly with the text, but to elaborate a little bit further, the UN is not the, the primary resort for economic recovery. At the front line will always be states and individual states that have their sovereign interests with respect to how they make policymaking choices, how they how they determine the path for recovery for economies, especially fiscal or monetary decisions. What the UN can do is to help in two crucial fronts. One is to rally uh, development assistance at the state level. The other is to rally private sector partnerships. This is where SDG 17 comes in, the partnerships with, for development um, that the SDGs are supposed to mobilize, the private sector has the most incentive, at least at this time, or at least the UN is trying to marshal the private sector to extend that help, to provide basic infrastructure for health facilities in schools, to provide that kind of incentive to open up um, employment opportunities. But we also accept that there is, a, there is a lag between job creation and a lag between job creation and, and employment. And in that crucial lag where real outcomes and real um, welfare matters, there must be social protection. And unfortunately, not all governments in the world are in a position to help um, provide that social protection. That is a space where development assistance can also be most crucial. So I see the UN helpful in rallying both states as well as private sectors to help this global emergency. Thank you, Professor Desierto. Uh, Professor Chun, uh, we have a question here for you. Uh, yes. What was the previous threshold for unemployment benefits in China? Mm -hmm. And how has that threshold now been changed in China due to the coronavirus? Yes, the, before the coronavirus, the unemployment benefit threshold is very high and basically the, it's very difficult to get that. So basically you need to meet the following condition. The first that you need to have continuous subscription to the unemployment insurance for more than 12 months. So, it, 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 so if you have like, like only six months of unemployment insurance that you will not be able to receive any benefit. So basically, the first thing the government did was to say that now we waive that requirement for even though the people wait on a very short period of time of subscription to the unemployment insurance, we will now distribute the money to them. So they made it very clear that this is not going to be an issue. Secondly, they also made the application fairly easy. So, so they basically made it, so they developed an app so everyone who, who have access to a cell phone could download the app from the governmental web page. 
and they would be able to request and apply for the unemployment benefit and they would uh, review that online so they do not they try to reduce the paperwork so they basically get rid of many of those things the third thing is that the government made a decision that for those people who have used up the unemployment insurance protection basically that if you have you have been in receiving unemployment benefit for a few months you still do not find a job then they would give you a discounted amount of money to support the person in the social assistance program so they basically a continuation of kind of ladder in order to ensure that people would be in one way or another protected and i think this is a bigger change from the previous policy thank thank you uh professor chun we have a question here too that um aims to link together your presentations and main your major insights the question is to what extent are the sdgs relevant to address the challenges in the informal economy in china and other asian countries Diane or Yifeng. Okay. Yeah. Um, briefly, I did answer this, but briefly, the SDGs are a plan of action. They are a set of commitments that states have already taken to follow international law and human rights law to realize all 17 goals. What is so crucial is that the SDGs go well beyond what states commit internally in their domestic laws or domestic policies or plans, precisely because the plan of action in SDGs in Agenda 2030 is to transcend current programming to future, present and future programming. This I think is important for China and other Asian countries because countries that assert or rather that commit to SDG implementation will be able to look at the social protection guarantees, the education guarantees, the decent work guarantees that are, uh, that are in the SDGs that are supposed to be monitored and overseen by states well beyond what current domestic commitments are. If anything, the SDGs tend to pull states towards a higher level of compliance um, well beyond what present political commitments may be. And in that respect, I have, there should be more protection afforded to the informal economy precisely because this is not dependent on domestic law. Thank you very much, Professor Desierto. Professor Chun, do you have any additional comments on this question? I, first of all, I fully agree uh, with what Professor Desierto has just suggested. And I think uh, out of the SDG goals, I think there are a few are really relevant to the tackling of informal economy in Asia and in China. For example, that one thing that is very persistent is really about the gender equality and non-discrimination. And we already, we, we see the, for example, we see the gap of income between men and women. And on average, I think the men would earn more than probably 20% 20, 20 more than women who are doing the same job globally. So this is a problem, not just about the informal economy, but when we try to formalize that, I think we need to address those issues. And uh, when we talk about decent work, there's, it is part, it is, it by itself is part of the SDG goals. And it has a strong reference to those international labor standards produced by the international labor organizations, including right to organize collective bargaining free from forced labor, coerced labor, and they are also entitled to occupational health and safety protection and a few others. So I think in a way that to, to, have a, to address the informal economy, it's not about the employment opportunity itself. I think we need to have a bit more comprehensive, inclusive approach to the issue to look at how we make the workers and how we are able to support those workers in in different aspects for them in training, in, in clean in access to clean water, 
in access to proper housing. And I, I think all of these would be part of the strategy when we tackle the informal economy in Asia and in China. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chun, Professor Desierto. Um, I've, I'm being asked to um, wrap up today's discussion. Um, it has been, uh, I think, very, uh, a very fruitful conversation. And um, uh, we've, we've learned a great deal about uh, the SDGs and uh, the ways in which they're being challenged right now and uh, the ways in which the, uh, especially the vulnerable, all of us, but especially the vulnerable populations are being negatively impacted. And I think there is a call to all of us to uh, be educated and aware of the impact uh, on vulnerable populations throughout the world and to think about how we can be engaged to uh, be proactive um, and effectively engaged uh, to help with the vulnerable populations. Um, I would like to uh, thank the audience for joining the Global Fragility and Pandemic Insight from Asia and Notre Dame virtual discussions organized by the University of Notre Dame's Leo Institute for Asia and Asian Studies with Notre Dame International and the Beijing Global Gateway. We hope you can join the next virtual discussion in the series on global fragility and pandemic with the Leo Institute and the Mumbai Global Center entitled as you can see in the slide, inclusivity in the post-pandemic world. It will take place on Wednesday, August 5th, 9 a.m. Uh, uh, Eastern EDT time and 6.30 p.m. in Mumbai standard time. Please register at asia.nd.edu. Thank you again. Professor Desierto and Professor Chun for your insights. And thank you uh, to my colleagues at the Lu Institute and the Keough School of Global Affairs and my colleagues at Notre Dame International and the Beijing Global Gateway. Thank you to the audience for participating uh, in today's um, online discussion. Thank you very much.